certain man, rich man who clothed himself in purple and fine linen, and who feasted luxuriously every day. At his gate lay a certain poor man named Lazarus, who was covered with sores. Lazarus longed to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, and instead dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. While being tormented in the place of the dead, he looked up and saw Abraham at a distance with Lazarus at his side. He shouted, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am suffering in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, whereas Lazarus received terrible things. Now Lazarus is being comforted and you are in great pain. Moreover, a great crevasse has uh, been fixed between us. Those who wish to cross over from here to you cannot, neither can anyone cross from there to us. The rich man said, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. He needs to warn them so they don't come to this place of agony. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They must listen to them. And the rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will change their hearts and lives. Abraham said, If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, then neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So friends, I bring you greetings on behalf of the 150 churches of our conference and the staff of the Pennsylvania Southeast Conference of these United Church of Christ. Link that connects our church's various and diverse ministries, both locally and globally. Together we provide our local churches and our pastors and congregations, hopefully in our best moments, with the training and inspiration they need to carry out our church's wider mission. We are always, always stronger together, and therefore we embrace diversity, and above all, we spread the good news of God's love for all. And indeed, my name is Kevin McLemore, and I am your somewhat new Associate Conference Minister for Search and Call. And I am deeply honored to be here worshiping with you on this Lord's Day. So a few years ago, I was reading a book by David Kurtzer called The Popes Against the Jews, The Vatican's Role in Modern Anti-Semitism, in which the author traces how the Catholic Church continued to fuel anti-Semitism in the 19th and 20th century. Of course, that had been rampant, of course, in Christendom since the beginning of the church. Three things stood out to me when I was reading this book. First, I was aware of the ways us Protestants have certainly nurtured anti-Semitism in our churches over the last 500 years or so, but I was not as aware of how the Catholic Church had done the same. Indeed, is any part of the Christian Church not guilty of this most diabolical and evil sin called anti-Semitism? I suspect not. Now, secondly, one of the odd parts of Catholic anti-Semitism was its particular focus in the idea that Jews actually tortured Christian children in order to use their blood for making of matzah bread during Passover. I mean, it seems obvious in a way that this falsehood would become a focus because in Catholicism because, of course, there's strong emphasis on communion and the importance of the elements in communion. Sadly, you can see how the old slanderous lies against the Jews continue to manifest itself in modernity with a different twist here. You'll find it in the QAnon conspiracy theory, where people believe that children are being kidnapped and tortured to death to extract some hormone that is used by the liberal elite to keep them sadly young forever, right? Sadly, what is old and evil and a lie is always new and evil and a lie, isn't it? But it's actually that third thing that came to mind while reading this book and looking at today's biblical text that caught my eye, and that is the kidnap kidnapping of Edgardo, uh, Edgardo Montero, who was a famous case of a Jewish boy who was kidnapped by the Catholic authorities in Rome in 1858. Jews in Italy were often forced to live in ghettos of Rome and a few cities elsewhere, and it was decreed by the Vatican that Jewish leaders had to listen to Christian sermons every Saturday on their holy day, and to be able to be available for public and sometimes violent mockery and jeering during Holy Week. Here is how the author 
briefly describes the Motero scandal in an article he publishes a few years after writing the book that I just read. In June 1858, on the orders of Pope Pius IX, papal police knocked on the door of the Montero's door in Bologna, Italy, and seized the boy from his family. He had been secretly baptized by a Catholic servant, and so according to church doctrine, could not remain with his Jewish parents. In a tear-soaked scene, Edgardo was torn from his father's arm and hustled into a police carriage bound for Rome, where he would be raised in church institutions. Worldwide protests followed. Thousands of people, from American protesters to the French Emperor Napoleon III, demanded the child's return. Pope Pius IX refused. It was believed that once baptized, the child had to be remain to be raised as a Christian. And the church told Montero family that the only way they could ever see Edgardo again was to convert to Christianity. In Rome itself, where Edgardo was taken, there was a building dedicated to housing and nurturing the conversion of the Jews. Edgardo Montero was raised in a monastery and eventually became a priest himself and never once saw his family again. This policy of taking Jewish children who were baptized against the family wishes had been going on for centuries. But this was one of the first times that it actually garnered international attention. And it was seen, obviously, as a, a violation of human rights and the violation of the sanctity of the family, as well as, of course, a violation of modern sensibilities. It caused a huge uproar throughout the world. And some have said that it was one of the reasons why the Vatican eventually lost what little temporal power they had left left in the following decades after 1858, culminating in the loss of the papal estates in the 1870s. In the end, one of the reasons the Vatican's political power crumbled was because of this boy's story, and the worldwide vitriol that was heaped on the Pope and the Catholic Church because of it. It was because finally, this vile practice of taking covertly baptized children from their Jewish families had a face a face, and the face had a name, and his name was Elgardo Motera. You see, oftentimes we need a face. We need a name to make something easier to see, to understand. It's the particularity of this violation visited on the family and this boy that made it a human thing and a rest and real to the rest of the world because vague stories that such practice had been going on for centuries didn't seem to enter into our imagination. There's something about a name and a story that it makes it something more, right? And that is true of the parable that Jesus teaches here today, where one of the characters is given a name. And it needs to be pointed out in this parable that Jesus does something he has never done in any other parable that he has ever told, at least as far as we know. And that is to give someone in his stories a name. And that name was Lazarus. This parable is only found in this Gospel of Luke, derived as it was from a written or some oral source that only this writer had access to since it shows up nowhere else in the other three Gospels. You may wonder, is this the same Lazarus spoken of in the Gospel of John, John 11, the brother of Mary and Martha, who was raised from the dead, John himself, or, uh, Lazarus was, coming out of that tomb in that dramatic fashion? In fact, that's actually one of my favorite stories in Scripture. That story is also a unique one, not found in any other gospel, but there doesn't seem to be any connection between the two Lazaruses, despite the same name. Particularly, perhaps the name Lazarus had significance across early Christian communities, was incorporated into various oral traditions, but the truth of it is that we simply don't know for sure why Jesus names someone in this particular parable. This made-up story meant to convey some spiritual truth. Of course, that name was... Lazarus. Nonetheless, it is only here that Jesus actually names someone in one of his parables. Only here. And surely that must mean something. But let's look at the parable and hopefully, maybe, try to figure out why. I mean, Lazarus is a poor man at the gate. He is sickly. He is covered by sores that even the dogs, who were generally unwelcomed and unloved in that time, in ancient time, would lick for their own sustenance. And then there is this rich man, unnamed as all the other characters, uh, unnamed as all the other characters in the parables are. Again, the rich man is not named. 
And he lives in a gated community, so to speak, right? And he wears purple. It's a sign of wealth, of privilege, royalty. And the reason why purple was so valuable was because the purple dye came from a rare mollusk found only in the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea. Lazarus is starving, and the rich man is not. But it must be pointed out that the rich man here is not sort of demonized. Right? His character is not impugned. He's not known for being especially villainous. He simply does what rich people usually do, which is to ignore the poverty and the poor around them. And the story does not call Lazarus necessarily good or anything like that. He is just poor, and the rich man is just rich. We both die, Jesus says, and though we might be tempted to make the story about the afterlife, that is clearly not the point here, nor should it be understood as a description of heaven and hell. In fact, scholars think that Jesus or those who crafted the story in the early church used a contemporary Egyptian story that almost mirrors this parable to a T. That doesn't surprise us, hopefully. Jesus has often simply repeated commentary and contemporary teachings to his listeners and he is perhaps using a well-known story to make a point. That should not be a surprise. In death, Lazarus is taken by the angels directly to Abraham's side, nearest to him, right? The place of honor. And the rich man dies. He is buried and finds himself in the place of the dead, the place that the Egyptians and Jews believed in, where most, if not all, went to in death. The rich man sees Lazarus and asks Abraham to help relieve his suffering. Interesting that even in death, the rich man feels as if the poor, like Lazarus, should still be at his back and call, even in death. No, Abraham says, you had everything in the last world, and now it is Lazarus' time to have everything. I mean, it is that great reversal, really, like Jesus said, blessed are the poor. That's madness. Blessed are the poor. Rich are the poor, Jesus says. They shall inherit the kingdom, the realm of heaven itself. A divide has been permanently set between the two, this great space in between, which is unlike the gates, of course, the rich man himself had hid behind when he was alive. Gates can be moved. They can be opened. The rich man never did, for he could have helped poor Lazarus. But this rich man, I'll say this, he is relentless in trying to claim that privilege he had when he was alive, even in death. Because now he wants Lazarus to be sent out to his brothers, not his sisters, interestingly enough, patriarchal culture there, right? To warn them of this possibility, that they should be generous to the poor before they die. But Abraham again refuses to make Lazarus the rich man's servant. Beside, they already had the warning signs in the words of Moses and the prophets. And if they won't listen to them... Why would they listen to someone like Lazarus or even like someone like Jesus who rises from the dead? Now, one could interpret this parable as perhaps a sop to the poor. Just be content with your poverty on this side of eternity because you will be rewarded in the next world. It's a useful message for those who have much in this here and now. And since, of course, it tamps down on the earth as people's discontent with what little they have, the problem, of course, is that this interpretation, it doesn't match the teachings of Moses and the prophets, as Jesus says here. It doesn't match Jesus' own teaching, where he explicitly says to those of us who have much that we should give everything we have to the poor. And I am not just referring to the story of the rich man who was told to give everything away in order to be closer to God, but earlier stories and teachings, especially found in Luke. One of the things about Luke is Luke is obsessed with having Jesus speak about poverty and poor and money. We think that Luke, of course, was an educated man. The Greek is very good, which means that he was well-educated and probably had money. And so interestingly enough, his struggle clearly throughout the Gospel of Luke is with what to do with what he has and to do so uh, in faithfully trying to follow Jesus. Look at chapter 12 for some of that. The writer of Luke has always Jesus talking constantly about money and things and the danger that they pose to our souls, to our humanity in ways that the other Gospels do not. The story is not about what happens when we die and not even really a story about the great reversal that happens in eternity to the rich and the poor, at least not in my eyes. Of course, it's a story really about what we do in the here and now. 
we who should be listening to Jesus and to Moses and the prophets. It is not about the great reversal that happens when we die, but the great reversal we should be enacting on this side of the veil, on this side of eternity. The story is always about now, not later, so to speak. And now, of course, is the time to be entering into the kingdom of God. Now, speaking of the here and now, I say this, of course, as a person who knows how far away he is from what Jesus commands of us here. And I suspect most of us in the same boat, because we are reluctant to do what Christ asks us to do, that is, give everything we have away to the poor. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to find some way to enact out this command, to enact this great reversal in the world, making the rich poor and the poor rich by our own personal choices to give what we have to those who have hardly anything. At the very least, we need to be humbled by what we have, grateful that there is anything to give away, to struggle with giving away, thankful and yes, also full of repentance for not being able to do what Christ asks us to do here in Luke chapter 12, elsewhere. But again, it's interesting that only in this parable is poor Lazarus given a name, only Lazarus. And I think that has to do with the fact that Jesus knew that people are often only moved to doing the right thing when they get beyond just talking about poor people as a group, right? Rather than a particular person, a particular human being who really does worry about getting food on their table today, or a worker fighting for a union at Amazon, hoping that maybe a full-time worker might be able to make more than $30,000 a year. There are people, these people are poor stories, right, who simply want a better paid life, right, with a fair wage. There's a reason why Black Lives Matter activists call out for us to say their names, say their names, let there be a particular face to a name, so we won't lose the particular humanity of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others who have been often killed unjustly. And there is a reason why a particular incident in Bologna, Italy, in June 1858, would help bring about the end of much church control of civic life throughout Europe which I will always say is a good thing, whether it be Protestant or Catholic. It was because what had been happening, the kidnapping of Jewish children for centuries, was finally attached to a name, and that name was Elgardo Mortera. It's only when particular stories are shared, and stories with names attached, that change can happen. I've often said, as an openly gay man, I've been out since I was 17 years old, I know that the text of terror for gay people. And I have taught them and given context and all that stuff over the years. I have never convinced anyone that God loves gay people as they are. They have only come to that truth because they came to experience a gay Christian or a gay person. Nobody could overcome their racism because someone had a better argument about racism. They come to a truth because their mind was changed by what they did and lived in the world, what they experienced through another person. It's always easy to love people in general, but it's harder to love them in particular, isn't it? But that is when the law and the words of the prophets are enacted, when we listen to particular stories and enact change that will show up in their lives and the lives of others and in our own lives. If we cannot do what Jesus asks us to do, which is to give everything we have to the poor and the marginalized, I mean, the very base level of what we can do is to listen to their stories, the stories of Lazarus, of George Floyd, of Elgardo Mortera. From the listening to those stories, stories with names attached, from hopefully there we can begin to change the world one choice at a time, personally, and on a much larger level, with our advocacy for those that Jesus seemed to constantly throw his lot in with. To begin to change the world, we begin with someone like Lazarus the one who was named, a particular person that puts a face to an issue, an injustice, whose name we hear and say today, the one who was given a story, the starving man who was named, sitting at the gate of an unnamed rich man, the one who was taken to be by Abraham's side. Justice, goodness, even love, the doing of such things begins always with the particular. One must love in particular in order to eventually love the greater whole. 
love those whose names we know, the stories that we can retell, some of which are stories as well, our own stories. We begin to change the world when we know the names of those who we need to work beside to change the world in order to bring about an even just a sliver of the realm of God on this side of the veil. Amen. Friends, join me in prayer. Gracious and living God, we thank you for being a God who does not give up on us. We ask for the courage to listen to difficult stories, to hear, to embrace, to take seriously, and from there to go forth and change the world, even in a small way. Holy One, thank you for your faithfulness to the church, to the world, for being a God who does not give up on us or that which you have created. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.